Yes. Okay. Well, um, on behalf of Nordicast, um, the Nordic Committee on um, Antimicrobial Susceptibility Testing, I want to welcome you to this um, Nordicast Basic AC webinar um, taking place today for two hours. And if you can see the program here, we will have a first session where Eric Matuszek from the EDL, the UCAS Developmental Laboratory in, Vector in Sweden, is going to give a lecture on the UCAS disk diffusion method, and then we'll have some discussions and meet the questions, which um, I am going to uh, to chair. And then we'll have at about um, 14 o'clock a 15 minutes break. And after that, Erica will give another lecture, lecture on reading zones, mm -hmm. um, followed by another discussion and Mentimeter session, which Ingrid Haugen from um, St. Olaf's Hospital in Trondheim is going to um, chair. And then we have some conclusions and a uh, short evaluation um, behind the scenes. And also preparing this webinar, we have um, Natalie Krieberg from, from Helsinki in Finland and Kaisu Janava from uh, Turku in Finland. Um, we will have many meet questions, so please use your browser, um, either on the computer or on the phone, or go to um, where you go to menti.com, or you can install the app Mentimeter on your phones. Um, and when you then use the code, uh, which is shown here, and which you also can find in the chat, um, 764064, you will go to the questions, and when Natalie opens the questions, you will see them, you won't see them until then. Um, and um, we ask you kindly to stay muted because otherwise we have some echoes and background noise. So please mute Hello. yourself. Hello. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, we can also mute you, but it would be good if you take care of that yourselves. Um, and the last detail here is uh, that the webinar will be recorded or is recorded, and the link will be shared on the mm -hmm. website page um, for later review. Um, so with that, I will give the word to Erica for the first lecture on UCAS distribution. Thank you. Um, there will be time for questions and discussions also. Uh, so if you have questions, you can write them in the chat uh, during the presentation, and then we will take care of them after the presentation. So the first presentation is about the basis in the UCOST disk diffusion method. So it will be about the actual method, how to perform it, but also to explain some background why it is important to follow the methodology as it is described. The UCOST disk diffusion is a standardized method, and by that means that we have standardized the different parameters that we can standardize, which is crucial to get reproducible and reliable results. We know that if we change these parameters, we will get different results. And the UCOST disk diffusion method uh, is standardized in regards of disk potency, the actual amount of antimicrobial agent that is on each disk, the media, the type of media, if supplements are needed, the pH, the agar depth, the inoculum to be used, incubation, time, temperature and atmosphere, and also reading of results. Disk diffusion is based on the principle that the antibiotic diffuses from a disk to form a concentration gradient in the agar. So the concentration of the agent is highest close to the disk, and then it decreases until it measures a specific concentration, which is uh, corresponding to the bacteria's MIC value for that agent. That means that uh, disk diffusion must always be calibrated to MIC values and MIC testing, which is our gold reference for antimicrobial susceptibility testing. That is what we do at the UCOS Development Laboratory when we develop low diameter breakpoints. Here you can see a summary of how to test different organisms with the UCOS disk diffusion method. For non-fastidious organisms, the inoculum is McFarland 0.5, uh, 
you should use unsupplemented millihint and agar, and the plates are incubated in air at 35 degrees Celsius for 16 to 20 hours. For most fastidious organisms, the, you will use MHF agar, millihint and agar, plus 5% hypogenated horse blood and 20 milligrams per liter beta MAB. The inoculum is the same, still McQuallan 0.5, but the plates are in in 5% carbon dioxide, same temperature, 35 degrees, and same incubation interval. For kind pylobacter, the method differs a little bit with the same inoculum, same media, but a different incubation in microaerobic environment, also at a higher temperature and for a longer time period. And from this year, we have also added a disk diffusion method for anaerobic bacteria. For these, we have an inoculum of McFarland 1, so twice the other inoculum to have a sufficient growth on the plates. The media is fastidious anaerobe agar with 5% defibrinated horse blood, which we now will call FAAHB. For anaerobic bacteria, the plates are incubated in an anaerobic environment at 35 to 37 degrees Celsius, and also for 16 to 20 hours. I mentioned in the beginning that also the agar death affects the results. Uh, it does by affecting the diffusion of the antibiotic. And you can see these two pictures here, the picture to the left showing a correct agar death and the one to the right, a plate with the two low agar death, where you will see how the diffusion goes back up again and the zone size will be bigger. So if you have a too low agar death, the zones will be smaller. And if the agar depth is too high, the zones will be. I'm sorry, if the agar depth is too low, below four millimeters, the zones will be larger. If the agar depth is above four millimeters, you will get smaller zone diameters. So the agar depth is important and it should be five mill four millimeters and we allow an occasional variation of plus minus 0.5 millimeters. Another important thing is, of course, how you store and handle the media. First of all, you should, if you buy plates, those should be stored according to the manufacturer's instructions. For in-house prepared plates, those should be stored at four to eight degrees Celsius. And it's not possible to say exactly the shelf life, so that has to be investigated in your own laboratory. Before using the plates for disk diffusion, they should reach room temperature. And it's also important that the surface of the agar is dry before use. If you have excess moisture, that might cause fuzzy zone edges or haze within zones that makes it much more difficult to reach the zone diameters. The problems related to excess humidity is most common on MHF and FAAHB agar. And the main recommendation is that there should be no drops of water either on the agar surface or inside the lid. This is more common with plates stored in black plastic bags or sealed containers than with plates stored in a ventilated rack. If you have a condensation on the agar surface or inside the lid, we recommend that you dry your plates. That can be done either in room temperature overnight or at 35 degrees Celsius with the lid removed for 15 minutes. Here is an example of what might happen if you have excess humidity. So the plate to the left shows an in-house prepared plate, which has been stored in a ventilated rack. We have used the same inoculum suspension to both plates, but as you can see on the left plate, we have a quite near clear zone and we can read the zone edge. On the plate to the right, we have a very a broad area of fuzzy growth. There is a, then a clearance where no, we have no growth and then growth again close to the disc. And this is the same susceptible isolate. So in this case, it's only a result of the plates being too humid. So it is worth the job to dry the plates to avoid this. 
When you prepare your inoculum, you should use an overnight coucher or non-selective media. That means that there shouldn't be any antibiotics in that media. It's also important to pick several morphologically similar colonies to avoid selecting an atypical variant. You then suspend the colonies in saline and mix to an even turbidity. The McFarland or the inoculum should be equivalent to McFarland 0.5. And we recommend that you measure that with a photometric device. If the density is too low, uh, then you should add more bacteria. And if the density is too high, you can add more saline. We don't have an a, a absolute recommendation on how much that McFarland 0.5 can vary, but for most um, densitometers, it's, uh, we recommend that you can use 0.4 to 0.6 McFarland. An exception to this is for Streptococcus pneumoniae. If it's suspended from a chocolate agar plate and not a blood agar plate, the inoculum should be McFarland 1 to get confluent growth of Streptococcus pneumoniae. Here is a graph that shows a little bit what happens with the zone size when the inoculum increases and why is it important to have that standardized inoculum. Uh, here we have tested four different antimicrobial agents for the E. coli ATC25922 QC strain. Uh, and there is not uh, a continuous scale down here. You can just see the different McFarland values, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, etc. And then up to 1, 2, and 4 in the right end of the, of the graph. And we can see quite clearly that the zones decrease when the inoculum increases. But you can also see that in this area from 0.4 up to 0.6, the zones are quite stable. When you inoculate the plates, you should dip a sterile cotton swab into the suspension. You should spread the inoculum evenly over the entire surface. That can be done manually by swabbing in three directions or by using a plate rotator. It's also important to know that if you're inoculating several agar plates with the same inoculum suspension, you should dip the cotton swab into the suspension for each agar plate. When we inoculate plates, we recommend that you do a little bit differently depending on if you are testing a gram negative or a gram positive bacteria. For gram negative bacteria, it's common to over inoculate the plates. So for gram negatives, you should remove excess fluid from the cotton swab by pressing and turning it against the inside of the tube before you streak the plates. For gram positives, you should not do that. You should use a wet cotton swab when streaking plates. And it's also important to take care to ensure that there are no gaps between streaks. So that's mean you probably have to streak your plates a little bit slower and maybe one more time on the rotator or one more, one extra layer if you streak manually. And the more carefully you streak the plates, the easier it will be to read the zones. So it is worth the time to put some effort into streaking the plates carefully. The discs should then be applied within 15 minutes of inoculation. It's important that they are in close and firm contact with the surface and you cannot move them once they have been applied because the diffusion will start immediately when touching the agar surface. It's also important to limit the number of discs per plate. You both have to limit it to over, avoid overlapping of zones and interference between agents. And also sometimes for sensitive organisms, you will have, to, they need more area to grow to be able to form inhibition zones. And you can see here an example of a plate where there are too many discs and very difficult to read the whole zone diameter. On a 90 millimeter circular plate, six is the maximum possible number. But I would say that for many organisms that is too, too many and it's four to five discs are often more appropriate for most organisms. For bacteria that are very sensitive, the appropriate number of discs might be as low as two and possibly three discs on a 90 millimeter plate. Examples of that is for Corinebacteria, 
aerococcus and for cutibacterium acnes among the anaerobic bacteria. It's also important how you store and handle the antimicrobial discs. First of all, you should store them according to the manufacturer's instructions, but it's good to know that some agents are more labile than others, and they may have specific recommendations. Examples are amoxicillin clavamic acid and carbapenems. The discs that you are using, that when you have opened the cartridge with the discs, they should be stored in a sealed container with the moisture indicating desiccant and also protected from light. It's also very important to allow the discs to reach room temperature before you open any new cartridges or the containers you use for disc storage. This is to prevent condensation, which otherwise might lead to rapid degradation of some agents. So there should be no temperature difference between your discs and the surrounding air when you open a cottage or a container with discs. And this means that it's actually better to keep your discs, the ones that you use, in room temperature during the day than them going back and forth between room temperature and fridge. But then, of course, for long term storage and for during the night, they should be stored in the fridge. And of course, but sometimes not remembered, you should use the discs before the manufacturer's expiry date, um, which also goes for plates, of course. Once you have applied uh, your discs, you invert plates and you should make sure that discs do not fall off the agar surface before you put them into the incubator. We recommend that you keep the stacks of plates as small as possible to avoid uneven heating. And here's another example where we cannot say exactly the correct number in a plate, a stack of plates, but usually a maximum of five plates per stack is appropriate for most, most incubators. And for most organisms and agents or almost all 16 to 20 hours incubation time is the recommended time, and it's only if it's stated otherwise in the UCAS distribution manual that you should incubate longer. And you can see here in this table that for non fastidious organisms, uh, 16 to 20 hours of incubation in air, and it's only for enterococci and glycopeptides that you should incubate for 24 hours to get the more secure results for those this combination of organism and agent. For some fastidious organisms, we have validated that you can prolong the incubation. So you can prolong to 40 to 44 hours. That means that you add 24 hours to your 16 to 20 hour interval for Corynebacterium, Aerococcus, and Kingella kingae if you don't have sufficient growth. The same for Campylobacter, the standard incubation time is 24 hours. And if you don't have sufficient growth after 24 hours, you can prolong to 40 to 48 hours. There's a typo there I see in that uh, box for that uh, exception for Campylobacter should of course say 40 to 48 hours if growth is non-sufficient after 24 hours. And then for the anaerobic bacteria, as already mentioned, the incubation time is 16 to 20 hours. And we have several examples of that the zones will change a lot if we incubate them longer, which means that the breakpoints are no longer uh, valid if you incubate longer. It is, of course, also important to follow the recommended incubation atmosphere. Uh, and we know that that will affect the activity on some agents. For example, if you incubate in carbon dioxide, that will change the pH in the media and some agents will get different zone sizes. But if the recommendation is to incubate in carbon dioxide, then it's very important that you do that because the breakpoints are then developed for incubation in carbon dioxide. Here's an example where we just took an E. coli, the E. coli QC strain, incubated one plate in carbon dioxide, the one to the left and then in air the one to the right and these are the zones mentioned here are aminoglycosides where you can see that we have three millimeter smaller zones 
for one of them in carbon dioxide and two millimeter smaller zone for the other one in carbon dioxide. So it makes a difference in which atmosphere you incubate your plates. In the UCOST method, we have summarized from when you start preparing your inoculum suspension until you put your plates into the incubator. Uh, and we call this the 15, 15, 15 minute rule. And we recommend that you should use your inoculum suspension optimally within 15 minutes and always within 60 minutes of preparation. That you should apply discs within 15 minutes of inoculation and then incubate plates within 15 minutes of disc application. And I will explain to you why this is important. First of all, if you leave your inoculum suspension at room temperature before incubation for a longer time, then what is going to happen is that for fast growing bacteria, the inoculum will increase because they will grow in the, uh, solid, in the saline uh, suspension. For fastidious organisms, they will probably not grow and start to die. Instead, so you will get a decreased inoculum. So you will change the size of your inoculum. It will be not, no longer be an equivalent 0.5. If you leave your inoculated plates at room temperature before you apply the discs, then the organisms may begin to grow. Some of them will grow quite well in room temperature as well. And then that will result in erroneously too small zones. If you then, on the other hand, leave the plates at room temperature after you have applied the discs, the pre-diffusion of the antibiotic may result in erroneously large zones because diffusion will go as fast uh, both in room temperature and in your incubator. So you should follow the 15-15 minute rule to get your expected uh, results and to be able to interpret your results according to your cost breakpoints. After incubation, you should examine your plates to see if you have an approved test. You should have a confluent lawn of growth. There should be no air between the colonies. Uh, and preferably, you should also have even uh, growth over the agar surface uh, to achieve uniformly circular inhibition zones, which makes it much easier to read. And in the example here with the plate, the inoculum is too light. And if you can see individual colonies, you should repeat the test and you cannot uh, trust that they are correctly reported. Here are some examples to the left of plates with a good uh, inoculum, evenly spread and confluent, and to the right, where it's not so good. These are examples for the same organisms. So the first plate up to the left is an E. coli. Then we have a Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And then the, on the second row here, we have a Staphorius and then a Haemophilus influenza. And on the plate to the right, the first plate for the E. coli is a little bit too light. You're starting to see air between colonies. You should aim at having a more heavy growth with no air between the colonies. With a plate for the Pseudomonas aeruginosa, you can see that for one of the discs, you have a straight line here instead of a circular inhibition zone. And this is only an effect of how the plates were streaked. So if you streak them carefully, you will have a nice and circular zone. The third example for the Staph aureus strain shows what happens if you are streaking plates too fast using a rotator, you will get these gaps in between and it also makes it more difficult to read. And in the last example for the Haemophilus influenza, we also have an additional problem where the inoculum is not spread over the entire agar surface. You are not using the entire agar surface, also making the zone edges more difficult to read. One thing that also is important when you streak your plates is actually not to push too hard with your cotton swab. If you just have it very light on the agar surface, you will have less problems with these different streaking patterns when you read your zones. 
So when you have decided this is an approved test, I have a confluent growth and I can read my zones. You should measure the zone diameters to the nearest millimeter with a ruler or a caliper, as in this example here. And then the zone diameters must be interpreted according to the UCOS breakpoints. And they are then interpreted into S, I, and R, susceptible standard dosing regimen, susceptible increased exposure, or resistant. To make sure that you use materials of good quality and the whole procedure and everything works as it's supposed to do, you have to perform quality control. There are recommended quality control screens in the UCAS QC tables, and they are used to monitor the performance of the test. And we then control both the materials and the equipment, incubators, etc., but also the procedures by streaking of plates, reading of zones, etc. You should always use an overnight culture of the QC strain and follow the same testing procedure as for clinical isolates. And we recommend that you include the antimicrobial agents, which are part of routine panels. UCOS recommends to perform quality control either daily or at least four times a week. And the reason for that is that a lot of things can happen in between days. You might change to another disc cartridge, or if you use your discs more seldom, they can start to lose their antimicrobial content. And here is an example of how you can evaluate your QC results, where you plot your zone diameters over time. Here you have results for 40 days in a row. You can see the lower QC limits, the upper QC limits, and also the target value, which is the middle of the QC range. And as long it's, as it goes a bit back and forth along the target, but is the mean value is close to the target value, then you can be certain that you have a good quality. You might sometimes have few isolates out of range, uh, which is not a problem if you can find a reason for it. Maybe the inoculum was too high or too low. And then you can see that we are back the next day. But you should always keep an eye on if your zones are starting to decrease over time and see if you have problems with losing activity of your antimicrobial agent in the disc. So going back a little bit to where we started, there are many different factors that will affect the zone size on a disc diffusion plate. One is uh, the medium, the type of medium, of course, which should be millihinton agar, from which manufacturer you buy your millihinton agar, your agar def, PA, and its supplements added. Uh, for MHF plates, it should be only 5% defibrinated horse blood and 20 milligrams per liter beta NAD and nothing else, for example. The size of the inoculum, which would be McFarland 0.5 for almost all of the bacteria. The age of the inoculum, it should always be an overnight culture. How you streak your plates, as we have seen, that will affect the zone size also. The technique you use, the speed you use, and if you remove excess fluid to avoid over inoculation that the antimicrobial discs have the correct potency. And that's actually not so uncommon. In some cases, we do have uh, discs, the same antimicrobial agent, but with two different disc potencies. For example, for ampicillin or amoxicillin clavulanic acid. So you have to set up a system where you're sure that you use the correct disc potency for the correct organisms. And storage and handling of discs is very important to maintain the quality of the discs. The incubation environment that you use the correct air, carbon dioxide, micro aerobic or anaerobic environment. The incubation temperature and time. All of these are factors that will affect the actual zone size. And then of course, when we also add reading, uh, the reported zone diameter is also affected by reading. And if we read the same zone diameter differently. But we will come back to reading of zones in the second presentation a little bit later in today's webinar. So, how what should you do to get reliable disc diffusion results? First of all, follow the described disc diffusion methodology. There is a reason for all these 
recommendations. So use the correct media, inoculum, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Don't make any own uh, methods. Use the U-cost distribution method as it is described. Described. It is also very important to use media and discs of good quality. If you've used materials of good quality, you will get results of, poor, of good quality. Uh, and of course, perform frequent quality control. Even if you know that you buy discs from a reliable source, you will have to check that they still have the correct activity after being stored and, and transported to your own laboratory. You will find all the information that you need to perform the UCOST distribution method on the UCOST website if you go to the header AST of bacteria in the left hand margin of the website. Then you go to disk diffusion methodology, and there are three main documents. The disk diffusion manual, which is a word document that describes the method in detail. There is a slideshow also that also describes the method that can be used if you want to educate your colleagues at your own laboratory. And there is also the reading guide with a lot of examples pertaining how, on how to read SOAPs. And since uh, January this year, we also have the disk diffusion method for the anaerobic bacteria published here. There is one document that describes the method and it also includes the QC criteria and another uh, specific reading guide also only for the anaerobic bacteria. And I also like, you, like to recommend you to look at the instruction videos. So if you go uh, to videos and online seminars instead, you will see uh, seven different instruction videos that we have prepared and those are very details. So there's specific video on only on how to prepare the inoculum, another one on how to ino inoculate the plates, etc. So very detailed instructions on exactly how to perform the UCOS disk diffusion test, one on reading of zones, and then there are additional videos on how to use the breakpoint table, how to store and handle media and disks, and then a separate one on quality control. You can also find these if you go to YouTube directly and search for your cost distribution method. And uh, as you can see, this is uh, myself and my colleague Jenny a couple of years ago, uh, but we still think it's a lot of fun to work with susceptibility testing of bacteria. And you are more than welcome to contact us if you have problems and we will do our best to help you to, to troubleshoot and sort out, uh, try to find the reason for deviating results or any problems with the method. So that was my final slide. Uh, I can take that question in the chat, uh, which, yeah, it says, why should the McFarlane be exactly 0.5, which is actually, it's, that's a good question. Uh, I don't remember exactly what we say in the distribution manual, but I could say that 0.4 to 0.6 is what we always have recommended uh, when people ask. Uh, and you cannot expect to end up at 0.5 for every single inoculum suspension that you do. So of course it should be an interval there too, but I think that 0.45 to 0.55, yeah, maybe that's a little bit better, but we all, not all densitometers have two decimal points. So 0.4 to 0.6 would be what we recommend. Oh, I'm sorry, Erica, I just wanted to say we are ahead of time. So if anyone has any other questions, please feel free to um, either write them in the chat or you can also just open your microphone if you prefer that. And in the meanwhile, Natalie is getting the mentality questions ready. People are starting to vote already. Yes, but you're welcome to post any questions uh, in the chat, also when we do the Mentimeter questions, or you can raise your hand or ask your question.
Okay, so um, if there are no questions just for the moment now, I think we'll start here with the first Mentimeter question, which is a little bit um, which is for us to evaluate who is participating, but also for you to get trained to use Mentimeter. So um, we asked you a very easy question for you to answer. Where are you from? And um, we think that could be Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, or Sweden. Um, I can see now that we are 100 people, participants on the, uh, the uh, on Zoom, and 82, three have voted here. So let's give it five more seconds. And I think now we can just show the results. So, uh, Six participants from Denmark, 13 from Finland. Um, Iceland is having an accreditation today. We know that, uh, so that's why they are not participating. 19 from Norway and 55 from Sweden. Um, I think that looks very good. Barbara, I think we hear you a little bit poorly. I don't know if you can do anything to, to improve that. It's like you're going a little bit back and forth. Okay, um, well, let me just um, get another microphone then. Just a minute. So, Natalie, I think we can continue with the next question. Hey, should the code be visible or is it hidden by you are viewing Natalie's screen? <laughs> Can't you see the code yes, at the top of the screen here? It's 764064. No. Maybe you can uh, write it to the chat because it's really hidden. Yes, it's in the chat now. Thank you, Erica. And do you hear me better now? Is that not too much? Let's try this. <laughs> okay. You'll have to interrupt me if it doesn't work, then someone else has to take over. Um, so let's start with the first question. What factors can contribute to wrong test results? Um, and here it's um, uh, several answers which can be right. You can see that on your phone as well. Um, so the first answer is incubation time, which is too long, or the agar plate, um, which is too deep, um, or an agar plate with a too low pH, um, or a wrong type of agar plate. Um, for example, an um, uh, Müller-Hinton agar um, uh, instead of an MHF agar. Um, or you forgot to eat breakfast. So please vote here. I can see there are already 100 votes. So I, th I think we can just show the results. Here. Um, I think we are ha very happy that uh, nearly all of you have, have ticked all the first four uh, choices here. So a too long incubation can definitely lead to wrong test results. Also the um, depth of the agar plate, which Erica explained, if the agar plate is not deep enough to low, then you will get um, larger zones. Um, also a wrong pH in the agar plate um, is going to affect your results, um, uh, for example, the amino glycosides. Um, and then if you use the wrong type of an agar plate, for example, an FAA plate for the arrows or an um, MHF plate for um, uh, non fastidious uh, organisms. Um, and obviously, if you forgot to eat breakfast, um, unless that leads to any mistakes you make, um, that shouldn't uh, uh, lead to any wrong test results. Um, so let's go to the next question. And that is the same question, but with different um, uh, possibilities of answers. 
Uh, so again, what factors can contribute to wrong test results? And these uh, five um, answers you can choose, and we can choose several ones, is um, the inoculum su suspension was used um, after, well, was prepared and then used after um, more than 60 minutes, or the discs were applied um, one hour after the plate was uh, inoculated, or the plate was inoculated uh, was incubated one hour after the discs were applied uh, were applied applied, um, or you chose the wrong incubation um, conditions like um, uh, this with or without five percent CO two or um, micro aerophil or um, uh, anaerobic. Um, and the fifth um, answer here is you forgot to eat. Uh, dessert. Yes, and here you can see the results, um, and um, all of you agree that um, the first, uh, again, the first four um, answers are correct. Let's just go shortly through this. Um, uh, the first three ones uh, relate to the 15, 15, 15, 15 rule. Um, Erica just um, guided you through. So. If you prepare the inoculum, it should be used um, within 50 minutes um, and at least within 60 minutes. And Erica explained how um, uh, that can ch change your results if you use the suspension after more than an hour. And that can be in two directions. Uh, either you can have a fastidious organism which is going to die and you don't um, and you get a false low inoculum, or you have fast growing um, uh, bacteria which is actually already growing in the saline solution, um, and then you get false high inoculum. Um, the second answer, um, if you apply the discs too late after the plate was inoculated, well, then you will already have the bacteria growing and will uh, probably get two small zones, whereas if you um, have put the discs on, but you have to incubate it, the plates, um, then uh, the, uh, the antibiotic agents will already diffuse into the agar and um, the bacteria are not going to grow as well as after they have been incubated. Um, so you will probably get two um, large zones. And incubation in wrong conditions obviously will um, affect your um, results um, as Erica showed you the example with the E. coli and the amino glycosides um, incubated at atmospheric air versus um, supplemented with CO2. Yes, let's go to the next question. And that is which of the following bacteria testing media combinations are correct. Um, Erica showed you a table um, on which media and which um, um, incubation conditions you should use for the different bacterial types. Um, so um, here again, you can choose several right answers. The first one is Staphylococcus aureus should be plated on AMH on um, Müller-Hentenagar. The second is um, Pneumococci, Streptococcus pneumoniae should be um, uh, tested on MHF, Müller-Hentenagar. Fastidious agar. The third one is Corydobacterium species should be tested on Bullet agar. The fourth is Bacteriasis fragilis is, um, should be tested on FAA agar. And by that I mean here FAA HB, so supplemented with false blood. And then the fifth um, possibility uh, to answer is um, Escobacter bomeni should be tested on MHF agar. Results are coming here. Um, and this is totally right that stuff aureus should be tested on MH agar, pneumococci on MHF, and Bacteroides fragilis is also right, should be tested on FAA HB agar. Whereas Corydobacterium species should be tested on MHF agar, and Astrobacter baumeli is a non fastidious organism and should be tested on MH agar. I would just like to add to that uh, question that even though 
some coriander bacteria might grow well on mill hinton agar. And as you need to back the bamona, it will definitely grow well on MHF agar. That's not a good reason to test them on that agar because the agar uh, components might affect the zone sizes. So it's always important to follow the exact instructions on which type of media to use on, for which type of bacteria. And the breakpoints will always refer to a certain medium you have to use. Otherwise, you cannot use the breakpoints. And with that, I think we go to the next question, which again is related. Um, so here we give you some bacteria incubation condition combinations and again ask you which are correct. And again, um, several of these combinations might be correct. Um, the first one is Antrococcus species um, should be incubated in atmospheric air. The second is that um, Streptococcus pyogenes um, should be incubated in atmospheric air. The third one is that Coronibacterium species should be incubated at air supplemented with 5% CO2. The fourth is that Clostridium perfringens should be incubated in anaerobic conditions. And the last one is that Klebsiella pneumonia should be incubated um, uh, at an, uh, conditions enriched with 5% CO2. So let's have a look at the answers. Again, um, you're very right here. Antrococcus species are non fastidious and would just grow at atmospheric air, um, uh, whereas Corinna. Corinobacterium um, are incubated in 5% CO2, and Clostridium uh, perfringens is an anaerobic um, bacterium and should be incubated in, in, in anaerobic conditions. Whereas um, Pneumococci, no, sorry, that is a Streptococcus uh, pyogenes, or all hemolytic um, uh, Streptococci uh, cocci should be incubated um, uh, in an atmosphere. Um, or in, in, in air um, enriched with 5% CO2, and Klebsiella pneumonia, um, again, non fastidious, should be incubated at um, atmospheric air conditions. Yes, and I could then again add that we try to keep the system as simple as possible. So if you have a millihinton unsupplemented millihinton plate, that should be incubated in air. An MHF plate should be incubated in carbon dioxide. We don't, we don't have any recommendations of MHF plates being incubated in air, for example. The only exception there is that Campylobacters are incubated in a microaerobic uh, environment. So Millihinton plates into air, MHF plates almost always into carbon dioxide. Then we go over to the next slide. Um, uh, again, a problem which Eric touched in her lecture, excess humidity um, uh, on MHF media. Um, uh, that can cause, um, and here is only one um, answer right, to small zones, to large zones, to fuzzy zone edges and or haze, or contamination. And, uh, Erica, explain to you how to um, how to store the plates to avoid excess humidity. So let's have a look at the answers. And as, um, it is exactly the um, the problem you get if you have excess humidity is that you get um, fuzzy zone ages or haze in the zones. And I can definitely see that you could also describe that as two small zones, but, but we would usually describe it as fuzzy zone edges and haze in the zones. Um, and that can be avoided by um, ensuring that you do not have um, excess humidity on your plates. Another thing we can add is if you have plates that are stored in plastic bags, either because you buy them from a commercial manufacturer or maybe if you buy them from another lab or, or you have a central media production site that packs them in plastic bags to increase the shelf life, 
then if you do have problems with excess humidity, you can also have a system where you unpack plates a couple of days a week before using them. So you have one storage of plates that are going to be used within the coming week, for example, those plates are unpacked in the fridge and then you also dry them in room temperature before you inoculate. Uh, so that's one system to reduce the excess humidity a little bit further if you have very humid plates which are packed in plastic bags. But of course, if you unpack the plastic bags already when you um, when the plates are delivered, the shelf life will be shorter than the one that the manufacturer has labeled them with. So that's important to know. But if you do that just one week before you think you will use the plates, then it's not a problem to unpack the plates. Thank you, Erica. Well, the next question, which of the following statements is uh, not correct? Um, statements are uh, the first one is um, to pick several colonies to avoid antibacterial variants and that is when you prepare prepare the inoculum solution um, that you dip into several um, similar colonies um, to avoid that you only when you only pick one that it could be an antibacterial variant the second um, answer is that the standard inoculum um, is mcfarland 0.5 um, the third one is for um, from chocolate, agar, you should um, use McFarland 1. The fourth statement here is uh, for anaerobes, you should use McFarland 2. And the fifth statement, again related to um, inoculum, uh, is that the growth should be comfortable. answers which one is not correct and that is exactly right um, for the anaerobes um, you, sh you should use a McFarland one and not two so the standard inoculum is 0 0.5 and then for pneumococci from chocolate agar you should use McFarland one and the same is true for all anaerobes you should use McFarland one to get a nicely confident growth and um, the other point here with the first um, uh, the statement was just to, again, repeat that when you prepare an egg inoculum, you should pick several colonies to be, ensure that you have a representative um, sample of, um, of your bacteria. Any comments on that, Erica? Nothing more to add. No, okay, then we'll go to the next question. I think Natalie is going doing a great job at the mess as the Mentimeter master here. So the next question is which of these um, plates fulfill quality criteria with regards to growth and can be read? And you see the plates um, better on the phone, as I remember. Um, but these are the same pictures as you've already seen in Monica uh, in Eric's um, presentation. Um, so you can pick uh, several plates and you should pick all the plates um, where, uh, which are ready to be read, which fulfill the quality. I think we can have a look at the answers. And these are again totally right. That's a little bit um, a discussion about plate D. But let's start with plate A and C, um, which definitely are not good enough to be read. Um, they are not evenly spread. Um, and Erica also pointed out that on plate A, um, on the top, actually, um, you don't have, um, actually, you nearly do not have any growth, so you wouldn't be able to read um, the zones um, for the, um, and that is, of course, played which is a streak manually, whereas the plate C is a plate which is a streak with a plate rotator. Um, where you have been a little bit too busy and a little bit too fast, so you get this spiral and, and the growth is not, not evenly spread. The
plate D is actually, um, it's not really um, um, uh, confluent, it's, uh, you can actually see some holes uh, in there, so, so that the inoculum was too little, really. Um, whereas plate B and plate E just look very, very bright. Barbara, I wonder if we have a problem with your sound or someone else. Will you try to mute yourself just to see if it hears? Yeah, it did. So we are hearing some very heavy noise from you. Yeah, it's like a... Okay, then I'll just try without the microphone. Is that better? Yes, it's much better. <laughs> and since I'm talking again, I can comment on this, this question as well. Uh, I mean, there is no, I get sometimes get the question if you cost recommends a rotator instead of streaking plates manually, and we don't, but regardless of which method you use, you should practice to try to get an evenly spread and confluent growth on all plates. And I would say that actually for those that are not so good on this in this example, I would not insist on that you have to repeat them to be able to report any results. But if you see that you have the patterns as in the C example here, that you streak too fast, then you should streak a little bit slower the next time to get a better growth. Also for example, D here is just borderline to light. I would report results from that plate, but I would try to not repeat it with other strains belonging to the same organism. So I think that's also a learning curve when you maybe start at the laboratory, when you're a new biomedical scientist, you, you will get to know more and more different bacteria and you will learn that which technique you need to streak plates to get an even and confluent growth. Okay, Eric, how is my sound now? Can you live with that for the next two questions or should you take over and I... Um skip over to another computer in the break. Yeah, we, we do lose you a little bit. So I can uh, I, take I over. I think then you just take over and I'll switch yes. over to another. Computer. So Natalie, we can go to the next question. Um, and the text here says, two large inhibition zones can be seen because of a disk with a too high content, disks stored incorrectly or expired, too thin agar, too heavy inoculum or not dipping the cotton swab between plates. And here you can also choose several options. And in the meantime, I would also like you to encourage you to write questions in the chat if you have any other questions relating to what we have been presenting and discussing here today and remind you that we will come back to a reading of zones later during the webinar. I think you can show the results now, Natalie. Yes, two large inhibition zones. So the correct answers are the first, third, and the fifth. So if the store, disks are not stored incorrect, if they are stored incorrectly or expired, you will lose your antimicrobial content and you will get to small zones. On the other hand, if the disks have too much uh, antimicrobial in them from the beginning, then you might get to large zones. Uh, and also with a too heavy inoculum, you will also get two small zones. The heavier the inoculum, the smaller the zones. So the other three options might give two large zones. So let's go to the last uh, question, and then I will come back to a question posted in the chat. So the last question here is which statement is not correct, and then you should only choose one. Um, U-cost distribution method is standardized and validated. Or the U-cost zone diameter breakpoints are freely available online. The U-cost breakpoint table is updated yearly. And the last option, the U-cost distribution method can be used for any pathogenic bacteria or antibiotic that you would like to test. And it's only one statement that is not correct.
and you can show the results, Natalie. Yeah, and you got it all right. You cannot use disk diffusion if there is no described method because you have no idea what your zone size will mean. Even if you get a zone of 30 millimeter, you don't know if that will correspond to a susceptible result. So very good, everyone. Uh, and I will go back to uh, a question in the chat, also referring to the inoculum size. So since we have talked about that for gram negative bacteria, you, it's easy to over inoculate your plates and get a too heavy inoculum. The question is, is it more appropriate to use the McFarland 0.4 for testing Enterobacterialis, for example? Um, actually, we do test that sometimes. And I think it feels better if you have E. coli or Pseudomonas to stay below, a little bit below 0.5. If you have Streptococci, you would rather go up closer to 0.6 but I, I don't think it makes a difference. What we see is that it makes a much bigger difference uh, how you streak your plates and how wet cotton swab uh, you have. So make sure that your cotton swab is very uh, wet and streak your plates very carefully if you have an organism that grows with small colonies, uh, those usually the gram positives. And if you have uh, organisms that grow very heavily, uh, for example, Enterobacterialis, definitely also Pseudomonas adenosa, Haemophilus influenza. Make sure to remove excess fluid from the cotton swab. And if you streak the plates, you can streak them a little bit less than if you use uh, another organism which, you, which have smaller colonies uh, and need to be streaked more carefully to have a confluent growth. So uh, in summary, I don't think it will make a difference if you use 0.4 for Enterobacterialis. It will make a much bigger difference how you streak your plates. Okay, and if you can hear me now again, hopefully, yes. well, that looks good. Um, then I think we should have a break now, as we promised, um, and we'll meet here again in, in 15 minutes. Um, and so 20 minutes past, 20 past two, we will yes. start again. Yes. Welcome back. And of course, during the break, if you want to post questions in the chat, please do so. Okay, see you at 20 past two again. So welcome back, everyone. Uh, we will now continue with a presentation only on reading of zones, and that will be followed also by Mentimeter questions and discussions. So I put again the code to the Mentimeter in the chat, uh, and you're welcome to write any questions in the chat during the presentation. It can be questions on what we already discussed with the basic methodology or on reading of zones. And also, if you have problems hearing any of us, please uh, post that in chat as well. So, uh, a presentation only on reading of zones. And reading of zones is the most difficult part of the method to standardize, because we will always see it a little bit differently. But we have tried our best to standardize the reading, to give you very clear instructions, and also have a lot of pictures explaining what we mean when we talk about reading of zones. Unless otherwise is stated in the disk diffusion manual, you should read zonages at the point of complete inhibition as judged by the naked eye, but with a plate held about 30 centimeter from the eye. So that's the basic reading instruction. You measure zone diameters to the nearest millimeter with a ruler or a caliper. We also recommend that you hold the plate at a 45 degree angle to the workbench that facilitates reading when 
uh, sonages are difficult to define. It also makes it easier to read zones that might change when you tilt the plate back and forth. We see that for Campylobacter, we see it for the anaerobic bacteria, but also for other alpha hemolytic uh, organisms such as alpha hemolytic streptococci. So just holding the plate at a 45 degree angle and not tilting it back and forth makes it easier to define the zonage. We specifically recommend that for Campylobacter since the zone size differ when you tilt the plate back and forth and also for the anaerobic bacteria, which I will come back to the anaerobic bacteria in the end of this presentation. The plate should also be illuminated with reflected light. And by that means that you should have a standard lighting source from above of you. And it's not enough with a ceiling light. You need a specific lighting source, like a standard desk lamp, for example, so that you can change the direction of the light and how close you have your lighting source. You should not use a magnifying glass and you should not use transmitted light. That is when you hold your plate up to the light and the light comes from the back of the plate. Uh, transmitted light is recommended for a few specific cases, but otherwise you should always have that standard reflected light and holding your plate about 30 centimeter from the eye. For millihinton plates without supplements, you should read the zones from the back of the plate against a dark background. One reason for doing that is that very, very light or hazy growth will disappear when you read from the back of the plate and you don't have to think about if you should take that into account or not. So just hold your plate uh, 30 centimeter from the eye at a 45 degree angle and read from the back of the plate against a dark background. It doesn't have to be black, but it should be non-reflective. Uh, MHF plates and the FAAHB plates used for the anaerobic bacteria must be read from the front of the plate and with the lid removed. But again, you should keep that distance of 30 centimeter from the eye and a good lightning with reflected light. For MHF and FAAHB, we don't specifically state that you should have a light background, but I would recommend that uh, since it's easier to see the contrast between growth and non-growth on these plates containing horse blood. And we will first go through some examples that could appear on me for many different organisms and for many different antimicrobial agents. And then I will go into more specific reading instructions that are specific for organisms, agents, or organism-agent combinations. As you all know, we sometimes will get the very clear and sharp zone edge, and then it's not difficult to read zones at all. But sometimes zone edges are fuzzy. And in this example, you can see that they're, it's a bit, the plates are a bit stripy. You can see that they are streaked by using a rotator. And we have tried our best, but they are still a bit stripy. And we do have this fussy zonage. And when you have fussy zonages, it's even more important not to look too close, to hold the plate about 30 centimeters from the eye against the dark background and try to get a picture of where you're, to estimate where the zone edge is. You should not look at every, each and every single uh, stripe going into the zone, but you should try to find the, the zone edge where it mainly is, but without ignoring growth and reading the zone at this, what might be an outer zone, you should take the growth into account, but you should not look for every, every single tip of those streaks. So again, very important to hold the plate at 30 centimeter from the eye and you should not look too carefully. And as I said before, we see patterns here from streaking, but this, uh, the appearance of fuzzy zonages, if the plates are streaked poorly, it's even more difficult to read these zones. So it's important to streak the plate carefully and well to get uh, zones that are easier to read. Sometimes you might also get colonies within the zones. And first of all, you should consider if they, that could be contamination. Nowadays, that's quite easy because you, to find out because you can always test with Malitov what is growing into your zone diameter. 
And I think when you test some specific organisms, you will learn that Enterobacter cloacae, they will more often have colonies within zones than, than E. coli would or Proteus muralis, for example. That it's quite uncommon for gram positives, but it might appear for gram positive bacteria as well. But if you're sure that it's not a contamination growing within your zones and you have a pure culture, you should take colonies within zones into account when you read your zone diameter. Uh, so you will try, you should try to find the colony free zone. And it's in the second example here, we think that the colonies are growing back and forth and quite close to the zone edge. So you can report that one as no zone if you want to. Another very similar example is that you sometimes clearly will get double zones. Then again, you have to think about, could this be um, a contamination uh, and investigate if it's contamination, look back uh, on your primary plate, for example, maybe run a multi-tough test, but sometimes it might look like these. The two first pictures here is for one Pseudomonas adenosa, for which we tried to separate two different uh, isolates and we could not. This was one isolate expressing its resistance like this. So if the cultures are pure, again, you read the inner zone. So, and you will also learn uh, when you perform disk diffusion that for some organism agent combinations, it's more common to have double zones than for others. And uh, we also have two examples to the right here for fluoroquinolones, where you do have a double zone. It could also be regarded maybe as a fuzzy zone edge, but again, you should take that growth into account when you read your zone, unless you think it's a contamination. For protease species, especially protease mirabilis, you might have swarming on your plates. And the rule is to ignore swarming and read inhibition of growth. It's not always very simple to differentiate between swarming and growth. But in most cases, I would say that swarming usually appears in a non-circular pattern. As you see in the two first pictures here, you have your zone edge, and then you have something which is non-circular within the zone. And that is the swarming that you should ignore. In the last example for trimetoprim, not, which is not uncommon, you do have a double zone, so an outer zone edge, an inner zone edge, and then you have additional swarming within that zone. And here you still you should read the inner zone, this is still growth, but you ignore that additional swarming, which is inside the inner zone edge. For proteins and swarming, that is actually the one thing on Millihinton agar plate that might be enhanced by two humid agar plates. So if you have a lot of problems with swarming, or you can see that your standard Millihinton plates are also very humid, that might be something to look into if it's worth to dry the Millihinton agar plates as well. Another thing that might be a bit difficult and that you have to practice a bit on is to differentiate with the, between growth and hemolysis. The standard recommendation here is to read inhibition of growth and not inhibition of hemolysis. And we have two types of hemolysis, beta hemolysis, which is usually free from growth, not so difficult to, to differentiate between the hemolysis and the growth. It's more difficult with alpha hemolysis, so for streptococcus pneumoniae, but also for uh, alpha hemolytic streptococci, virulence group streptococci, you might have alpha hemolysis. But the basic rule here is that it's often growth in the areas with alpha hemolysis. And you can detect this by tilting the plate back and forth. So if you hold it at a 45 degree angle to the workbench, then you tilt it back from you and towards you, and then you can quite easily see if there is growth in the area of hemolysis. So in our example here to the left with an a beta hemolytic strain, you can see up here, for example, that you have clearly have an area of uh, hemolysis within your zone, but it's not difficult at all to decide where the growth ends. For the alpha hemolytic strain to the right here, uh, it's more difficult and it is also difficult to find a good picture uh, explaining this. So I think it's for 
all of you have seen uh, plates in the lab. So take those plates, tilt them back and forth, and then you will see that there is a growth in the area of alpha hemolysis. It's more like an inner zone or a double zone. And maybe the, co the colonies are flattened a bit in that inner zone. But if you tilt back and forth, you will see that there is growth in that area. And even though there is no recommendation from UCAST how to test and read gradient tests, I could just uh, remind you that the same is true for the gradient test, where you should always, always also do the same with the alpha hemolysis and take that into account because there is growth in the area of alpha hemolysis. So then we will go into a bit more specific reading instructions. The first one is for enterobacterolis if you test with ampicillin, ampicillin sulbactam, sulbactam or amoxicillin clavulanic acid. And this is a quite boring exception, but their uh, background is that if you test, here we have examples for ampicillin only. If you test ampicillin for an enterobacterolis on millihintanega from different manufacturers, you will sometimes have that double zone and you will sometimes not have it. And it's only when we read the outer zone that we get similar results on different agars and that we get the good correlation to the MICs. So here you should ignore the inner zone and it might, it might look a little bit different depending on from which manufacturer you buy your agar and your discs. Usually you can see it by testing your E. coli QC strain, 80CC25922. If you have the double zone there, you will probably have it also for the clinical isolates belonging to the enterobacterolis group. Um, for enterobacterolis, you might also, you probably test mesilinum uh, since you are in the Nordic countries. Uh, and there you sometimes will have colonies within the zones. And if those colonies are isolated, if they are um, not uh, close to each other, then you should ignore them. So isolated colonies should be ignored. Uh, in previous versions of the table and the distribution method, we had this was only valid for E. coli, but a very nice work done by Barbara and her colleagues show that the same recommendation is valid also for the other species which have breakpoints for mesilinum. So this now goes for all species that can be tested for mesilinum within the Antibacterolis group. It's even more common with colonies within zones for phosphomycin, phosphomycin, uh, which should be tested with a disc containing also glucose 6 phosphate. So you could check that. Um, a 200 microgram disc. Uh, and here you can see that sometimes you will get only a few colonies within the zones. You, they might be quite many, but if they are isolated, you should still ignore them. And it's only when you start to get growth where the colonies are close to each other that you should take them into account. So those were the specific instructions relating to the enterobacterolis group. Uh, we also have a very important uh, exception for stenotrophomus mult maltophilia with trimetoprimazole from a toxazole. And maybe you also know that this is the only agent for which we have breakpoints for, for stenotrophomus maltophilia. So it's very important that we get it right. In this case, you should ignore any growth uh, within the zone if you can see an outer zone edge. And as you can see in, in these examples, the growth can be quite su substantial. But if you can see an outer zone, you read that outer zone and then you interpret according to the breakpoints. And in the last example here, you, we can see that we have heavy growth up to the disc and no sign of inhibition zone. Then you can just report as six millimeter and resistant. This will also differ a little bit depending on the Milhinton agar source, but also isolate dependent for different stimulant of monosmaltophilia isolates. And then we have two exceptions where you should actually take your plate and hold it up to the light, which is called transmitted light. So for enterococci and vancomycin, and for staphorius and benthyl penicillin, you should uh, in, examine the zonage with the plate held up to the light, as in this example. 
for enterococci and vancomycin. And for both these uh, examples, this only goes for when you have zone diameters above the susceptible breakpoints. So for enterococci and vancomycin, the susceptible breakpoint is more than or equal to 12 millimeter. Then you should examine the zone edge from the front of the plate, you remove the lid and with transmitted light. If the zone edge is sharp, as in the first example here, you should report according to the breakpoints. So if it is 12 millimeters or above, it will be reported susceptible. But if it's fussy, if you have colonies growing within the zone, or actually if you are uncertain, you should uh, not report uh, susceptible. You should suspect that it's vancomycin resistant enterococci and perform confirmatory testing, even if the zone is more than or equal to 12 millimeters. And this also takes some practice. Uh, and again, this is an example where it's very important to streak your plates carefully to be able to estimate if you have a fuzzy or a sharp zone edge. For Stavorius and Benzal penicillin, we also have this recommendation to hold the plates up to the light. Uh, again, it's only for those with zone diameters above the susceptible breakpoint, more than or equal to 26 millimeters. But here it's the opposite. If the zone edge is sharp, then this isolate does not produce beta-lactamase and you should report it as susceptible if your zone edge is above the susceptible breakpoint. And if you have a zone edge like this, it's fussy. Or if you look at it actually a bit further away from the zone edge, you can see that the growth decreases gradually up to the zone edge. It's like a beach. Uh, then you should report uh, susceptible to benzyl penicillin. Now I think I mixed it up. I will go back and say, if you have a sharp zone edge, then you have a beta-lactamase producing isolate and it should be reported resistant even if the zone diameter is above 26 millimeters. And it's only if it's more than equal to 26 and you have this de degradation of growth up to the edge that you should report susceptible. And these examples are also included, of course, in the distribution manual, in the reading guide, but actually also in the UCOS breakpoint tables. Since it's crucial that you know exactly how to interpret these results. Another a little bit newer recommendation is for hemophilus influenza and beta-lactam agents. And this is also something that's affected with excess of excess humidity in the plates. Uh, so it's usually enhanced if you have excess humidity, humidity in your plates. Uh, you might have something that looks like this. You have an outer zone, then you have an area free from growth, and then you have growth again close to the disc. So this is similar to the example I showed in my first presentation on excess humidity in plates. But we see it more often for hemophilus influenza and beta-lactam agents. And if you have this, you read the outer zone and ignore that growth that appears again close to the disc, but you need to have an area free from growth in between. If you have that hazy growth within the whole zone, then you should take it into account. And a little bit about the anaerobic uh, bacteria. Um, it is a little bit trickier to read zones for the anaerobic bacteria on the FAAHB media, and it's important to practice on it. And we have a specific reading guide for the anaerobic bacteria with many different pictures and examples on zones. The first recommendation is that you should ignore faint haze within the inhibition zone and read the most obvious zone edge. And the easiest way to find out is to hold the plate at a 45 degree angle, as we always recommend for the anaerobic bacteria, but then if you have haze or you suspect haze within the zone, you tilt the plate more towards you. If that haze disappears, then you read that obvious zone edge. So it helps a lot to tilt the plate towards you to be able to find that obvious zone edge. As for other bacteria, and in the middle example here, you should ignore hemolysis and swarming. That might appear for Clostridium perfringens, for example. And a third example is for clindamycin, and it's uh, particularly important to look for colonies within the zones for clindamycin, and those should be taken into account. account. And for all anaerobic bacteria, you should always take colonies within the zone into account that could appear also for beta-lactam agents, for example. So those should never be ignored, and those are different from that haze, light, light haze that might appear within the zone. 
And of course, drying of the plate reduces the haze and makes it easy, easier to read zones. And we have this reading guide uh, at the UFAS website, one general reading guide where you all first have all the general instructions and then all the specific reading instructions. There are additional specific instructions that I haven't presented today. Uh, and then at the same web page, also the specific reading guide for the anaerobic bacteria, where we have many more pictures and examples for the different species that are included in the disk diffusion test. So I think we are now ready for um, questions. Yeah, um, Erica, there is one, um, uh, one question in the chat from Frida. Um, does it matter if you measure with top part or lower part of the... Of the caliper. Uh, of the caliper, yes. Mot in Swedish, yeah. Uh, no, it does not matter if you use the, the lower part or the upper part of, of the caliper when you read zones. Um, in our lab, we could see that some people, we do it a little bit differently, but it doesn't matter when we move zones from, from the same plate. Okay, then I think then we should go over to the Mentimeter questions. Yes, and of course okay. you are still uh, welcome to post questions in the chat while we yes. look questions. Absolutely, so we have uh, a little bit less time now, so I'll try and be swift, but as uh, Erika said, please uh, post any questions and we will probably address them when the Mentimeter session is finished. So the very first question is, how should you measure an inhibition zone? Um, should you always use a magnifier? Or uh, should you, if possible, measure the diameter? Or should you always read the radius and then multiply it by two? Yes, so I think now we can start looking at uh, what people have voted on. And this was at the very beginning uh, of the second part. Uh, and Erika did say that, yes, you should try and measure the diameter. And importantly, you should not uh, use a magnifying glass to try and look uh, closer uh, at the growth. Next question. So what should you do first when there are colonies within the inhibition zone? Should you take the colonies into account when you are uh, measuring the zone? Or should you ignore the colonies when measuring? Or should you check for purity? Or should you retest? So I think most people would have voted now, according to the numbers. So yes, uh, most people agree that you should start off with checking uh, for purity. And uh, if it is unpure, then you would consider retesting. So next question. After you confirm purity, then what should you do if there are colonies within the inhibition zone? Should you then retest? Should you read the outer zone edge? Should you take all the colonies into account? Or should you take only the large colonies into account? Think you yes. can show the results now? Yeah. So, yeah, uh, most of you agree that uh, you should take all the colonies into account, and uh, which is also correct. Now, this is a general rule, 
and it is usually correct. However, in uh, real life, there is always exceptions to any rule. But uh, as uh, Erika also said in her lecture, in general, you should take all the colonies into account. So the next question. Now there is uh, only two answers to this one. How many millimeters is this inhibition zone? And the disc is amoxicillin clavulanic acid. Yes, we do not have any information on the um, on uh, which bacterium this is. So uh, uh, in hindsight, this is uh, this could be a question with uh, uh, where you would consider this a bit um, differently, isn't that so, Erika? But yes, but I would say that this does not uh, pertain to that inner zone that you could see if you have colonies within the zone, also for amoxicillin, clavulanic acid and ampicillin, if this is an enterobacterialis, you should take that those colonies into account. So I would say that 60 millimeter is the correct uh, answer. And it's only if you have uh, a double zone uh, that you could ignore that inner zone and read the outer zone. So colonies should be taken into account also for that combination. Yes, so this was, this question was quite difficult, but um, it tests a few of the points that Erika mentioned in her lecture. Yeah, next question. How do you measure the inhibition zone of cefotaxim and E. coli? Should you read the outer zone edge or should you take all the colonies into account? So most of you would take all the colonies into account, which is uh, correct. So this is um, Cephotaxim and E. coli follows the general rule of taking all colonies into account. There's no uh, particular exception in this case. And it's not uncommon that an ESBL producing isolate looks like this, that you get a zone diameter and then you get colonies uh, within the zone as well. Next question. What should you do in the case of a double zone after you have confirmed purity? Should double zones always be retested? Should you read the inner zone? Should you read the outer zone? Or should you report the average of the inner and outer zones? Yes, most of you agree that you should read the inner zone and that is again the general rule uh, that Erika mentioned as well. Um, and uh, there might be some exceptions, but uh, unless otherwise stated, that's uh, what you should do. Yes, I could also add that even with the exceptions that we have to read the outer zone, if there is a double zone for, for ampicillin and amoxiclav and enterobacterialis, and also ignoring the colonies within zones for mesilinum and phosphomycin, if you are unsure, it's, a, it's better to take the safer way, take everything you see into account than to ignore growth when you should not ignore growth. Um. Yes, so the next question. Now, how many millimeters is this inhibition zone? So only two answers again. So most people would um, measure the inner zone. And I think this is a pseudomonas and meropenem, but I don't think that would make much of a difference. 
Um, so it's correct. Uh, you should take, you should measure the inner zone when there's a double zone, like in this example. Next question. In the case of proteus species and swarming, should you then add gentamicin, a gentamicin disc to remove the swarming? Or uh, is it the case that the inhibition zone cannot be read? Should you ignore the swarming when reading the zone? Or should you take the swarming into account? Yeah, that's very good. Uh, more or less all of you think we should ignore the swarming when reading, and that is, of course, correct, like I get, did say. So um, uh, what you want to measure is the inhibition of growth, uh, whereas swarming is not uh, the bacteria dividing and growing towards the disc. It's actual um, bacterial cells um, moving. So that's uh, something else that we're not uh, looking at when we measure the zone. So very good. Next question. Now, what can you do to make it easier to read if there are fuzzy inhibition zones on Mullehinton Ega? Should you hold the plate up to the light and look closely? Or should you hold the plate against a dark background and use a magnifier? Or should you hold the plate against a dark background and approximately 30 centimeters away from your eye? Or should you pass the plate around to everyone and calculate the average measured diameter? Very good. So like Erika said, Mille Hinton Egas are best read against a dark background. And even though the uh, zones are a bit fuzzy, you should not start looking closer or use a magnifying glass to read the zone better. Uh, asking experienced colleagues for help is a, can be a good idea, but I don't think anyone would start calculating an average measure diameter between the people in the laboratory. Next question. In the case of hemolysis, what should you do? Should you measure the inhibition of hemolysis and ignore the growth zone? Or measure the growth inhibition zone and ignore the hemolysis zone? Or is it so that there is usually growth in the hemolysis, so you can just measure the hemolysis zone? Or are hemolytic bacteria always resistant? Very well, you should definitely measure the growth inhibition zone and not the hemolysis zone. Now, the third alternative that there is usually growth in the hemolysis um, is correct in the case, or it is correct in the case of alpha hemolysis, but not in the case of beta hemolysis. So um, for all hemolysis uh, seen together, uh, that alternative is not correct. Next question. How many millimeters is this inhibition zone for this E. coli and ampicillin combination? Yeah, actually, I think I, I am the one who took the photo. Maybe I'm also the one who stripped the plate. And I could use this uh, plate as an example of a not so very nicely stripped uh, plate as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when we look this closely. Yeah, so streaking could have been improved a bit, but um, um, the question is still uh, valid, I think. So most people would uh, measure this diameter as 18 millimeters, and that is also correct. 
so this is an exception to the general rule of measuring the inner zone uh, when there is a double zone. So Erika mentioned that especially some batches of muller hintnagels do cause a, a thin um, double zone that you should ignore in um, uh, with E. coli and some uh, antibiotic disc combinations. Next question. Isolated colonies in the inhibition zone should be ignored when measuring the diameter in the case or cases of Enterobacterialis and cephalosporins, Enterobacterialis and phosphomycin, Enterobacterialis and gentamicin, Enterobacterialis and mycelinum. Yeah. So like we learned in Erika's lecture that there are some exceptions to the rule uh, about counting all colonies. Um, and that rule, that exception goes for Enterobacterialis and Mycelinum, which most of you answered, and then some answered Enterobacterialis and Phosphomycin. And that is a bit tricky or misleading alternative, perhaps, since it says Enterobacterialis and there aren't breakpoints for all. Enterobacterialis and Erika mentioned E. coli and phosphomycin. So that could have confused, uh, or maybe it's a bit uh, imprecise uh, from us. That's yes, good. exactly. For mycelinum, it goes for all the enterobacterialis with breakpoints for mycelinum, and for phosphomycin, the disc diffusion test is only valid for E. coli. Yes. And with um, that, we will leave over to Barbara <laughs> and pause a little bit here. Yes, I'm sorry. I think I have to interrupt because we're running out of time and I think we should um, uh, have our three evaluation questions. Um, so I'm sorry, we will have to skip the last four questions here because we really would want um, you to answer some evaluation questions here. Um, I'm sorry, Ingrid, for in interrupting you. Um, so what we would like to ask you, and we are very happy that um, we had 100 uh, participants here, several of you were sitting together, so more than 100 people, we would like to rate you the difficulty level of this webinar, which, would, which was of the target group was not um, um, biotechnicians specialized in AST, but um, doing performing routinely um, AST in the lab. So please let us know if it was too easy or too superficial, if it was just right, or if it was too difficult or too de detailed. And I think we can just show the results right now. Okay, it looks like um, we were just right for most of you. Um, so that's very nice. Let's just go over to the next slide then. And that is um, how would you rate the ratio between presentations and Mentimetic questions? Um, did we have too few Mentimetic questions or were we just right? Or did we have too many Mentimetic questions? Please vote. So I can see you're doing that. And Natalie, I think you can just view the, um, show us the results. So um, most of you think that was just right, but um, some think we should rather have uh, a bit less Mentimeter questions, and we'll definitely take that into account for our next webinar. So um, let's go then to the last question, and that is what is your overall impression of the webinar? Are you very satisfied, satisfied, partly satisfied, or not at all satisfied? And, Please be honest here. So I think we can also here show the results. Um, so the majority satisfied um, or even very satisfied. So I think that is um, that is very good. Um, with that, I think we can close the Mentimeter um, 
questions here and um, uh, it remains uh, to me to say thank you very much that so many of you um, joined us here today. Um, uh, I quickly want to personally apologize for my sound um, problems and I want to thank um, Erika and Ingrid and Natalie and um, Kaisu for um, organizing uh, uh, this um, webinar and, uh, and presenting. Um, and I think we can just, um, if you have any questions, we can just have the chat open for, for some minutes because now we had to um, skip the last questions uh, here in the, in the Mentimeter session. So if anyone has any questions, so feel free to stay um, um, a couple of minutes and, and we, can, um, we can discuss them from the chat. Um, but otherwise we close the session here and Erica, please interrupt me if you want to say something. I just wanted to add that you are, of course, always welcome to contact us via email if you have questions. And our contact information is on the Nordicast website. Um, uh, and yeah, please send emails to us if you have questions or problems with the UCAST methods. And thank you everyone for participating today. Goodbye. Thank you very much and goodbye.